Horrific things happen in the world we live in. We would like to believe only evil people carry out atrocities. But tyrannies are created by ordinary people, like you and me. I'd never been to the former Yugoslavia before in my life. So what actually struck me about the country was how beautiful it was, how nice people were, and yet how ghastly they could behave. Psychology can help us understand how such ghastly behavior can occur. You're going to see famous psychological experiments and a few new ones. Our guinea pigs are ordinary British people. You'll see how willing we are to obey. I was wondering if it would be possible to have your seat. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah? Thanks a lot. And how readily we play the bad Samaritan. We would even electrocute a stranger. 315 volts, the answer is ink. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Seemingly simple responses add up to a recipe for tyranny. This started as a student role play. Well, now you boys got to come to some kind of decision here. Initially, I had created an interesting social psychological experiment. But within five days, what I had created was an evil, tyrannical regime. I'm going to take you on a journey which I know will shock you. It has me. We're going to see how each and every one of us is capable of doing terrible things to other people, even when we're sure we couldn't. And in the right, or should I say the wrong circumstances, we can create our very own tyranny anywhere. And it's possible in five easy steps. From childhood on, we create out-groups as opposed to our own in-group. We class certain others as underdogs. This can result in prejudice. And this is our step one. It's easy to create superior in-groups and inferior out-groups. Once group differences are established, in the wrong circumstances, a leader can exploit them for their own ends. Teacher Jane Elliott began her crusade to demonstrate the irrational nature of prejudice 30 years ago in Iowa, USA. The morning after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I was teaching third grade in all-white, all-Christian Riceville, Iowa. There were no people of color in that town. Most of my children, in fact, all of my children, had never been in the presence of a person of color. And I didn't know how I could explain that death to my third grade students. You think you know how I would feel to be judged by the color of your skin? I don't, do you think you do? No, I don't think you'd know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? No. I decided that the next morning I would do what we do in my society. I would pick out a group of people on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they have absolutely no control. It might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah! Sounds like fun, doesn't it? I mean, the blue-eyed people are the better people in this room. Oh, yes, they are. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown-eyed people. While the brown-eyed people have to stay in. The brown-eyed people do not get to use the drinking fountain. You have to use the paper cups. You brown-eyed people are not to play with the blue-eyed people on the playground because you are not as good as blue-eyed people. The reaction from the students was immediate and intense. Brown-eyed people were immediately angry, confused, shocked, saddened, withdrawn, and blue-eyed people were immediately delighted, arrogant, superior, condescending, vicious little third graders, and they had been 
excellent friends, absolutely fast friends the previous day. What happened, John? Russell called me names and I hit him. Hit him in the gut. What did he call you? Brown eyes. Well, he did. What's wrong with being called brown eyes? It means that we're stupid. Well, not that. Oh, that's just the same way as other people call uh, black people niggers. I was utterly astounded at how quickly my third graders knew how to play the game. What are you crying about? Sorry. What are you crying about? My feelings were hurt. More than 30 years on, the exercise provokes the same passions, even in adults. Should I adults. feel sorry for her? I don't expect you to. Should I feel sorry for her? We live in a society in which people are allowed to treat those who are different in an ugly way because of their differentness. I cannot shed tears for a young white female in this exercise, who knows that this is an exercise, who knows that it's temporary, who knows that she's getting a college credit, one hour of credit for being here. What her study shows is a way in which tyrannical leaders can create artificial differences between people and then superimpose on those minimal differences uh, values of inferiority and superiority, dominance and powerlessness. And then we are on the path to tyranny. In spring 1999, one man waged war on his own personal outgroups. And it happened on our own doorstep. David Copeland bombed black and Asian communities, then targeted the heart of the gay community in London Soho. There was a bang and there's smoke and there's people just crawling out. People, the people that are crawling out, they're getting helped, you know, because they can't walk. It's loud, you can hear it a mile away. Just that boom. Three people died. More than 70 were horribly wounded. Today, the Admiral Duncan pub is fully restored, but other wounds are harder to heal within the gay community. People come in either to target the area because they know it's gay and gay friendly, or because they're ignorant and they presume they can take their prejudices and their homophobia wherever they are, and especially if they're a little drunk, it'll come out all the more easily. Discrimination doesn't have to be obvious, which is probably better if it's obvious. It can be hidden, it can, that's the worst part. Um, it can be little things of everyday life that pile up, and then you know that you have to behave a certain way. The experience of the Soho bomb illustrates another level at which this ordinary group categorization uh, can escalate to. It goes beyond simply saying, our group is heterosexual, they're homosexuals, uh, we think our way of life is better than their way of life, to saying that we reject what that group stands for, we reject their very identity, it's a threat to our way of life, and we want to eliminate them. Prejudice is completely irrational, it's in its nature that it's irrational. We do still have whole groups of people who are excluded and who can be regarded as out groups. Large numbers of homeless people, people begging on the streets, disabled people, people with mental illness, people with physical disabilities suffer terrible discrimination. And if in your mind you decide that certain groups of people are excluded from the dignity and respect and humanity that everybody else enjoys, then you don't afford them the same rights as other people. We all harbour prejudices. Unknowingly, we may each be taking the first step to tyranny every day. From early childhood, we learn to obey, to do the right thing. We assume it's for our own safety and the well-being of society at large. Even so, we'd like to believe that we wouldn't obey just any order. Do you always do what you're asked? No. Do you always do as you're asked? Mm, not always. Not always. Do you always do what you're told? No. 
Do you always obey orders? No. <laughs> The famous psychologist of the 1960s, Stanley Milgram, conducted a simple yet revealing experiment which demonstrates how wrong these people are. We often do obey with little questioning. We set out to repeat Milgram's experiment using secret cameras. Hi there, sir. Hi, how are you doing? I wonder if it would be possible to have your seat. Why? Um, please, would you mind? Would that be okay? Why do you want to? Um, would you not, would you not want to give me a seat? Do you, do you need it, yeah. Have you got that leg? Um, no, not really. Thank you very much, very kind of you. Okay. Um, just wondering if you could possibly have your seat, if that's okay. Have my seat? Yeah, is that okay? Why do you want mine when it's all the others? Um, just, just really wondering if, if you'd give me your seat. Did you not want it? No? Don't mind. If you need my seat, I should sit. Thanks, that's very kind of you. Great. It's evident that every society needs the majority of people to follow the rules, to be compliant, to be obedient, to respect authority. I mean, that's the glue that holds all of these individuals together. The problem is, where are the boundaries to that obedience? Hi, how are you doing? I was just wondering if it would be possible to have your seat. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, thanks a lot. Out of the 30 people we approached, an astonishing 50% gave up their seats, despite challenging the oddness of the request. We then added an authority figure into the mix. Hi there, how are you doing? I'm um, just wondering if I could have your seat, if that's okay. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Okay, great. Thank you. When you add an authority element, when there was a person in a uniform, that obedience, that... Uh, clicking, that click were automatic responding went up to a hundred percent. Every person that was asked complied. Um, is it possible to have your seat? Yeah, no problem. Yeah? Great, thank you. Half of us have a tendency to act without thinking and that's where we begin to have tyrannical danger that when people can be made to act on these impulses, on these conditioned habits without stopping to say, well, why? Why, do you, why should I do this? All over the world, there are examples of blind obedience leading to human rights abuses. One took place on the football pitches of Kosovo. Before the continuing breakup of Yugoslavia began, Albanians and Serbs played in the same teams. In spring 1991, as the players trained at Pristina FC, the Manchester United of Kosovo, Serb troops moved in and forced any Albanians to leave the team. Overnight, Pristina Football Club was ethnically cleansed. One of their top players, Afrim Tovalani, was 24. His future as a professional footballer was still ahead. The orders from Belgrade drove Afrim and his colleagues into the hills, where they were forced to play in secret. We decided to play after three days to one secret match in a village near Pristina, but the police found out and came to break up the match. They threatened us and demanded, while we were still playing and while we were still organizing matches. What particularly shocked Afrim was how the segregation was handled. The behavior of the Serb police was very brutal. These people weren't acting like police, but like savages. I couldn't imagine how people could behave like this to each other.
There were policemen from Pristina that I knew and I asked them, why are you acting in this manner? You know that I'm a citizen of Pristina. You've known me for a long time and you know that I'm not a terrorist but a citizen of Pristina, of Kosovo. They said, we are just obeying orders. This is something we need to do. It's an order from above and we can't disobey, because if we do, we'll lose our jobs. It was an order they were forced to do. Now 33, Afra owns a pizza restaurant. He's back playing with Pristina FC and coaches the junior squad. He's lost the best eight years of his career. It matters that those people weren't selected for the football team because although it may seem trivial in itself, it's actually the thin end of a large wedge because it can start off with something like that and it can end up with them being excluded from their jobs, driven out of their homes, not accepted as having the same rights as everyone else. Over the course of human history there have been more crimes committed in the name of obedience than in the name of disobedience. So it is not the disobedience, not the rebel, it's not the the unusual kind of de deviant person who is the threat to this society. The real threat to, to all societies are the mindlessly, blindlessly obedient people who follow any authority. got a dominant group and a tendency to obey authority. What happens when the leader asks us to do something against our better judgment? When we're caught up in the wrong circumstances, you'd be amazed at what harm we'll do to others, even if we think we couldn't. If someone asks me to harm someone, there is no way I would do it. No, I wouldn't. No, no, no way. No, I don't think I would harm someone. If I can't, I can't think why somebody would. Do you think you could ever harm another human being? No, I couldn't possibly do that. Yeah. No, definitely not. They're wrong. Our step three on the road to tyranny looks at how readily most of us will obey an authority who commands actions against our conscience. An extraordinary experiment in 1961 at Yale University did exactly that. Incorrect. We'll now get a shock of 75 volts. Soft hair. He kind of did some yelling in there. Psychologist Stanley Milgram created a situation in which people were asked to act with increasing severity against another individual. In other words, do harm. Just how far can you go in this thing? The question is, would American citizens, ordinary Americans do that? if an authority figure dressed in a white lab coat put you in a situation where you had the power to uh, literally electrocute a very nice stranger, would you do it? To this day, the results are shocking. Uh, Keith, you may look on if you'd like while we get set up in here. Would you roll up your right sleeve? Here's the setup. The volunteers were told they were to be helping science look at ways to improve memory. The teacher will read a list of word pairs to you like these. A blue girl, nice day, fat neck, and so forth. You are to try to remember each pair. For the next time Using a word game, one person would play teacher, the other the learner. Now what I'm going to do is strap down your arms to avoid any excessive movement on your part during the experiment. The teacher would punish the learner when he got an answer wrong to see if this encouraged learning. And the punishment? An electric shock. And this electrode paste is to provide a good contact to avoid any blister or burn. This machine uh, generates electric shocks, and when you press one of the switches all the way down, the learner gets a shock. Milgram chose 15 volt increments because like each increase seemed so minimal. In middle position after you released it to show you which switches you've used on the board. Axe, needle, stick, blade. Pass blade. Wrong. Nice. I want the 180 volts. Please continue, teacher. Needle, you're going to get a shock. 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me land on I'm not going to kill that man. Eh? I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. If the leader says, look, I'll be responsible, 
then we are relieved that we are not going to be blamed. A lot of what we don't do is because of the fear of being blamed for a negative Please outcome. Continue. Go on, please. You accept all responsibility? The responsibility is mine, correct. Please go on. Gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paint. Answer, please. Are you all right? 405 volts, the answer is moon. Also becomes awkward to challenge authority. And it's easier to blindly close your eyes and keep pressing the button and not, not listen to the, the shouts of the victim, feel the pain of the victim. Excellent. Fast. Bird. Car. Train. Plane. Go on, please. With the please answer. 450 volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I'm not getting no answer. Please continue. The next word is white. Don't you think you should look in on them, please? Not once we've started the experiment. Well, what if something's happened to the man hadn't attacked or something there? The experiment requires that we continue. Go on, please. Don't, uh, don't the man's health mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must... But he might be dead in there. What we see illustrated here is a number of the variables that are involved in transforming ordinary good citizens into perpetrators of evil, into uh, people who blindly follow fascist, tyrannical leaders. So you need an ideology, a belief system that makes everything seem to make sense. In his case, it's we want to help people, we want to improve learning, we want to improve their memory. So all fascists start with some ideology. We're doing God's work, we're saving our country uh, for freedom, for democracy, whatever it is. So that's, that's a critical first step. And, and then what you see is you assign people roles, so people have some meaningful role within that structure. You have an authority who supervises those roles. The act that you're going to get them to do, which is ultimately evil, you start with very small steps. It's only a, a minor step. In his study, it's a, it's a 15 volt shock, which you can't even feel. And then you increase in incremental, small increments, this level of aggression, this level of hostility. When you release it, the shock stops. Milgram repeated the experiment 17 times. Anyone he asked said they would not electrocute a stranger. In fact, of his 900 volunteers, two-thirds went up to 450 volts. That's nearly twice the voltage in our main supply. At the end, Milgram reveals it's all a setup. The learner is an actor. God bless you, boy. You, you have me shaking in here. Nice to see you. Hey, man. Feel better now? I sure as heck do. That's good. I thought you just about had it in there. That's good. Propaganda, such as these anti-Semitic posters, portray the outgroup as beasts. It makes it easier to do them harm if they're seen as less than human. In another version of Milgram's experiment, this was put to the test. The learners were described as animals. In every case, the teachers were willing to use higher voltages far more readily. We know the horrific end that was the genocide in Rwanda. But at this step, we focus on the role that dehumanizing propaganda played in inciting this tragedy. Rwanda is one of the poorest nations in Africa. The people are members of tribes, and there are two main ones, the ruling Hutus and the minority Tutsis. They have a long history of rivalry. People live off the land with an economy dependent on the coffee price. They were almost untouched by the Western media until the early 1990s when along came a new, exciting radio station, Radio Libre de Mille Collines, that grabbed the nation's attention. It was a jokey modern, western-style, funny radio station. It played popular music, it had audience participation, it told jokes, sometimes outrageous jokes. It had a huge audience all of a sudden. 
The Hutus saw the radio, which was run by government cronies, as a powerful tool to broadcast widely and quickly an anti-Tutsi message. What the government needed to do was to try to incite the people about the danger that was facing them as an excuse for them to slaughter their perceived enemies. This very trendy radio station began to convey messages of absolute horror. Cannibals, they eat men, these Tutsi. They will tear out your stomach, your liver and your heart. You know, they will eat your children. I think that fear must translate itself eventually into a form of release which can be a very, very, very violent release. Having incited violence, the radio station then broadcast details of where the enemy Tutsis could be found. One massacre happened in Niyaraboye, in the village's little Catholic church. In April 1994, a thousand local Tutsis fled here for sanctuary. A mob of Hutus surrounded the church, their passions raised by their military leaders and a flow of dehumanizing language from the radio. <laughs> Their leader said, Hutu should come out of the crowd. Some people were desperate and lied. They were shot dead straight away. Then their leader said, we were snakes, and they should smash our heads. That was when they started to cut people up. The killers herded their victims into the church. Children were a priority target. When you kill rats, you don't spare the babies, their leaders said. We were pretending to be dead. They took stones and smashed the heads of the bodies. They took little children and smashed their heads together. When they found someone breathing, they pulled them out and finished them off. The soldiers left Valentina for dead. One of the butchers of Niyaraboye, Dani Bagaruka, claims to have been encouraged by the dehumanizing language he heard on the radio. We heard the radio telling us to be strong and to cut down the tall trees. Our local leader explained these trees were the Tutsis. We were listening to the radio and because of that and what the soldiers were urging, we started to kill our neighbors. What happened in Rwanda was clearly the end point of any tyrannical regime. But it was driven by our step three, dehumanization of the enemy. 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus were murdered during the 1994 genocide. The Hutus responded to the propaganda, just as the psychologists could have predicted. People shouldn't have kids which are crippled. It's horrible for the child. It's nasty. You're consigning a child to a life of horrible disablement and misery. I think it's unfair to bring people into the world who are going to be malformed or have a miserable life. How can you say that? But no, come on. Say it like it is. You're a eugenicist. You, would, you want these people exterminated. Free speech is the cornerstone of any civilized society. This is Speaker's Corner in London, and it's a powerful symbol of the freedoms enjoyed in Britain. For more than 150 years, people have flocked here on Sundays to give vent to their opinions. Making racist comments is illegal, otherwise anything goes. If you try to censor free speech, then human rights can be abused. If there aren't any voices to challenge a particular viewpoint, 
then obviously it's going to have more authority, more influence, more impact than in a community where all kinds of different ideas are being freely exchanged all the time and challenged. Oh, the new stereo, the new pop, whatever. Is that healthy? We put our right to free speech to the test. Actor Anthony Gabriel wore a secret microphone. We filmed the reactions of the crowd. How many families are broken up? I think people with disabilities, if they can find out before they're born, they shouldn't be there. They should be terminated. Ah, no, you said you said earlier on you weren't in fear of that. So now you 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 have got a hidden agenda here. I asked you I asked you whether you were in favour of eugenics, and you said no. Now you're saying you want disabled people terminated. So let us have your true agenda here. Consider to be disabilities. Is homosexuality a disability in your mind? Sickness. Sickness. No, that's, 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 I think if somebody's going to be born into the world, you can find out before they're born into the world that they're going to have a terrible, terrible life of hardship and misery. But what if why, 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 what, why give what, that person that life? What if they look, well, look, look? Let's look through history. Look through history. Look at uh, uh, creative people who have had horrible lives, horrible things happen to them, but they've written books or they've written theatre or they've written things which have inspired other people. Who? Stephen Hawking? What, what about Bach? Hawking's a good example. Absolutely, I agree with you. Right, but, but somebody else would come along with great ideas. But you would have them killed. I would have them before they were born. Right. So would you terminate people with mental illnesses? I think if it's something which is hereditary, I think it'd be very worth doing. If there's a madness in the case, you would also be terminated yourself. <laughs> I didn't agree with his with his views or his statements, and and I felt that somebody needed to say something. The rest of the crowd was quite placid and not saying much. So I think the worst thing that could happen is someone comes to Speaker's Corner, says things, and is unchallenged, especially if they're not very well thought through or they're just downright offensive. All I'm here is um, pre presenting um, my opinion. Now, whether people agree with me or not is not the point. Whether they hear me is the point. No matter how outrageous our actors' comments, people fell into one of two groups. They either just listened or shouted back. In social psychology, they're known as the bystander and the dissenter, and that is step four. Free speech is extremely important, and the freedom of expression is important precisely because it's important to be able to dissent from regimes that are tyrannous or anti-democratic. That, again, takes us back, rather, to the idea of how wars and brutality and gross criminal um, abuse of human rights occurs. Um, it only occurs, it seems to me, within the context of relative silence. Suppression of all rebellion, suppression of all dissenting opinions is the hallmark of tyranny. That is, it is not to allow any opposition, not to allow any alternative perspective on the illusion that they have created typically an illusion that they will give you security, that they will uh, give people a better way of life, when in fact what they are doing is taking away people's freedom and people's liberty. The tyrannous regime suppresses the dissenter, as seen here in Burma. For decades, this former British colony has been run by an army-controlled socialist regime that isolated the country, wrecked its economy, and repressed its ethnically diverse people. Now children are used as slave labor as the country tries to rebuild its shattered infrastructure. In 1988, a massive and peaceful people power movement demanded an end to dictatorship. A new junta seized power. It quelled freedom of expression and the democracy movement. Crowds of peaceful protesters were machine gunned by troops. Thousands died. Others were imprisoned and tortured. One was Ko Aung. In Burma, almost political prisoners are that they put in solitary confinement. They put in a, that leg iron horizontally between two legs, two angles, and chains was attached, and then you can walk, carry that. You know. And that, that, that iron rock was at 80 inch long. And when you, when you walk really hard, 
and they get that sort of iron lock at least one month, minimum one month and maximum six months. Human rights groups want the military regime to be tried for genocide and crimes against humanity. Nothing has happened. My opinion is that British government and Indonesian community, they didn't do a nut for the, our struggle in Burma. And they know what's terribly going on in Burma. They knew it. One young Englishman did do something. James Maudsley chose to become a dissenter. He deliberately got himself arrested, handing out pro-democracy leaflets. His aim was to draw attention to the genocide of the Karen minority in Burma. The day before he left, he was best man at his twin brother Jeremy's wedding. We knew that was his intention, to, to get uh, put into prison, because he, he wanted to confront the military face on, and the only way of doing it was to end up, in his own words, to reside at their pleasure. Like Ko Aung, James was also tortured by the regime. If anyone stands up to them, then that is a challenge to their power and their authority. James was a white Westerner who stood up to their authority. He needed to be stamped on. Random beatings, um, white light on 24 hours a day, white noise, radio noise being played outside his, his, uh, his cell 24 hours a day. Essentially all the techniques to break somebody's spirit and break someone's morale. Um, friends in Thailand sent him fresh fruit and it was left um, out of his reach but visible, rotting, until they gave it to him. Um, stupid little games which prison guards play largely and sometimes more serious. A campaign in Britain secured James' release. This was the positive result of a group action. And that's why malevolent leaders fear and quash group power. But if enough people say, no, this is wrong, then we can bring uh, th that regime, which is a totalitarian regime, we can bring it into line by humanitarian standards um, before too many of the local population are, are, have their fingers burned so heavily that they, they lose their fight. Every day the papers are full of horrors around the globe. And what do the majority of us do? Nothing. Yet being a bystander is one of the most essential ingredients of maintaining a tyranny. We're at Lancaster University to look at this very issue. Psychologist Dr. Mark Levine is getting to the heart of why we do or don't help others. If you ask people whether they'd help, nearly everybody says, of course I would, because we don't want to be seen as not caring for other people. But actually, all the research says that, by and large, people don't help. They turn away. If there's any reason for not looking, they won't look. Mark Levine has chosen football to look at this problem. In Britain, football represents one of the most powerful ways in which people divide themselves into us and them. The team strips mark their differences. He's used these strong allegiances to see how the tribal instinct can affect our ability to help or to turn a blind eye to others in need. We wanted to show that it's when people feel that they have some kind of relationship to a stranger that they'd be more likely to help them. And football is a really good domain for doing this kind of thing because football fans feel powerful bonds to other football fans. The contest. James well out. Uh, Cole, oh dear, oh, we can do without that. A little bit of trouble. Dr. Levine chose one of the most intense rivalries, that between Manchester United and Liverpool. It's explosive, both on and off the pitch. Warm in their rivalry and no more. We took four secret cameras and a stuntman to the Lancaster campus to catch on film whether people will help a stranger in distress. 
All the unsuspecting test subjects will be Manchester United fans. The stuntmen will fall in their path wearing either a Manchester United or a Liverpool strip. When will the fans play the Good Samaritan? First, our stuntman is in a Manchester United shirt as the Manchester United supporter approaches. A positive result. Even though it's raining, she helps her fellow fan into the building. Next, we try the Liverpool strip. This Manchester United fan sees the fall but sprints inside. Back now in the Manchester shirt, our stuntman falls in front of another United supporter. Another positive result. The common bond overcomes any embarrassment or inconvenience. Back to the rival teams again. The Liverpool shirt goes back on. This Manchester United supporter hardly stops long enough to see if he's OK before disappearing into the building. So what did you do? I asked if he was OK. I didn't walk over, but I asked if he was OK. And one of the first things you noticed was he was wearing a Liverpool yes. shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was the red colour more than anything that draws me, and then I saw the letter. I was like, ooh. <laughs> Should have left him. <laughs> Our stuntman fell in front of 12 Manchester United fans. He was helped to his feet every time he wore a United shirt. He was left to help himself every time he wore a Liverpool shirt. Dr Mark Levine's ongoing research into the issue of bystander behaviour backs up the results of our small study. On the one hand, the positive thing about this research is it demonstrates that when we feel ties to other people, then we're more likely to help them. The negative side of the research potentially suggests that when we see people as outgroup members, as others, then we're less likely to go and help them than we might normally be. People have tremendous anxiety over their decisions to intervene and also not to intervene. Nobody easily turns away. Being a bystander doesn't mean doing nothing. If you don't intervene, that's an active decision not to get involved. And it's when people don't get involved, when they see any kind of injustice, that that injustice is allowed to continue. This bystander behaviour is paralleled in society at large. We can extract one example from a complex situation with the distinctive rival groups of Arab and Jew. In Israel, the Palestinians often live in appalling conditions, not far from impressive housing developments built by Jewish settlers. As the gulf between the two groups widens with restricted human rights for Palestinians, there's ongoing violence. The Palestinians throw stones and sometimes open fire. The Israelis retaliate with live rounds and rockets and the force of law. Until September 1999, Israel effectively legalized torture under the term moderate physical pressure. This enabled the secret police, the Shin Bet, to brutalize suspected Palestinian terrorists using shackling, shaking, and isolation. A liberal middle-class nation stood by and tolerated this behavior for years. Even before the introduction of moderate physical pressure in 1987, Palestinians like Basim Erjamal were arrested and ill-treated for suspected involvement with the PLO. I was a student at uh, the Beirut Arab University in Lebanon. And of those days that uh, when the PLO was mainly based in Lebanon, the Israelis used to assume that each or any Palestinian who was studying there, who was passing through there, or whatever, he must be Good, he must be good in touch in a way or another with the PLO. So anyone was a suspect. What were you studying? I was studying English literature. And how far were you into your course? Well, the first year. 
in your first year? Well, I was 18 years old, I was 18 and a half, something. And did you have any connection with the PLO? It was days. Yes, I did. The Israeli army's use of moderate physical pressure has led to the jailing and torture of some 10,000 Palestinians over the last decade. They have their day in court, but with only the veneer of a fair trial. There is a lawyer, there is a defense, there is a judge, and you know, somebody translating to you what's going on because you don't know Hebrew. And sometimes they allow to, to a certain extent, in certain cases, in very, very certain cases, to the priest to be there or to the Red Cross to be there. But there is no justice. What sentence were you given? I was given two lives, and life, uh, according to the Israeli laws of those days, and still I think today, it's 99 years for each life, and 10 years. The two lives and 10 years, if you add them, to 108. The Palestinians believe they have suffered grave injustice at the hands of the Israelis who have long suffered anti-Semitism. It's one of the great ironies in Israel that um, the Israelis were people who um, originally came together out of a sense of common shared nationhood and identity. Um, because of the Holocaust they'd been subjected to, um, not just in Nazi Germany but in Europe generally, and that they should have come together but have done so at the expense, as it's perceived, of another people. Um, and I think that illustrates the way in which human rights abuses um, may perpetuate themselves, and one abuse may create another abuse. The recent escalation of violence in Israel, in which even teenage boys are becoming martyrs, has many causes. But it becomes easier to understand in part when it happens in a country that was prepared to legalize torture effectively, while most of the population stood by. At this stage, you're probably thinking that you'd never be capable of inflicting human rights abuses on another human being. But you'd be wrong. The ability of ordinary people to do evil acts is a part of our psychology. This ability to do wrong was seen in a powerful experiment in 1971. Twenty-four ordinary 19-year-old student volunteers were arrested and imprisoned in the basement of Stanford University by Professor Philip Zimbardo. This is our Stanford prison. We replace office doors with these prison cell bars in each of three uh, office rooms. Over here is solitary confinement, the hole, a tiny little closet. Uh, where boys were put in, sometimes naked, sometimes in shorts, and either sat or stood up, sometimes for hours on end, for infringements of the rules. Over here is where they ate, on a small table, so they could be under the surveillance of the guards, and other inmates could be watching while s students in the privileged cell ate and when they didn't. Simply by the roles they were asked to play, either prisoner or guard, Professor Zimbardo discovered that he could create his very own tyranny, and it took just five days. On day one, these groups had everything in common. They were, they were identical. It was just by a flip of the coin that they were guards or prisoners. Within a matter of a few days, there was nothing similar about them. And what you saw was the emergence of two classes of people, the all-powerful and the totally powerless. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. The brutality of the superior over the inferior group soon took hold. Remember, this was meant to be role play. What we're seeing is the final step on the road to tyranny. You can give me the blankets and sleep on the bare mattress, or you can keep your blankets and 416 will stay in another day. Now, what would it be? What we saw was 
a gradual escalation of aggression, of hostility of the guards against the prison, which built each day over the successive days. Not only was it physical aggression, hitting the prisoners, there was verbal aggression, abusing them. Uh, they began to use the prisoners as their plaything, as their toys, having them engage in activities which were of a sexual nature. You be the bride of Frankenstein, and you be Frankenstein. I want you to walk over here like Frankenstein and say that you love to a man Get out of Frankenstein and walk. You didn't actually walk like Frankenstein. You didn't actually walk like you. I love you, two Americans. Get up close. Get up close. I love you, two Americans. I love you, two Americans. You smile, two Americans. You get down here and do ten push-ups. Two, three, four. Even I, an experienced experimenter, uh, a liberal person, got caught up in, in this crucible of human nature, not as a prison psychologist, not as an experimenter, but as a prison superintendent. And so these bizarre things began to seem normal. Smoking is a privilege. Smoking, smoking is a privilege. privilege. What is smoking? A privilege. What? A privilege. The guards became increasingly sadistic, particularly at night when they thought the cameras were off. Five days into a 14-day study, the experiment had to be stopped. It took an outsider to recognize the human rights abuses that were going on. The Stanford Prison Study is a microcosm of the development of a tyrannical regime. That uh, we did it in just a week. T typically, tyrannical regimes might take longer, but you know, you're talking just weeks or months, where essentially you're transforming a democracy. You're transforming people who care about one another, who have compassion, uh, where where right is dominates over might and you're changing all of those values. You're getting people to suspend their morality, uh, to, to gradually begin to blindly obey authority, to comply with rules that, they, they, that don't fit the, their basic uh, values or, or, or beliefs, uh, and to begin to conform, to begin to behave as a unit, as the communists, as the Nazis, as the fascists, to take on this group identity which then dominates all of their thinking. Thank you, Paul Wesley. These are the behaviors that culminate in our step five, extermination, or the terrible euphemism, ethnic cleansing. What happened in the Stanford prison experiment brings to mind the stories from Rwanda, Burma, and the Omaska concentration camp in Bosnia. There, pupils and teachers from the same school became either torturer or victim. The whole thing was so personal because these crimes against us were committed by our neighbors, uh, former schoolmates, for, former teachers, former doctors. At the beginning, uh, actually, they didn't dare uh, look into our eyes because, well, not, not all of them, some of them felt ashamed, I feel, because of the whole situation. But it's very interesting, once they started actually um, carrying out, out executions, uh, not, that, not only that they became so violent, they became so thirsty for our blood that uh, it's something I, I still can't understand, this transformation that, that can happen in, in, in such a short space of time. How is it possible that... Uh, you know, your, your community, uh, people that you know so well, people that you, that you think knew you so well could turn on you, you know, and, and kill you for, for no reason whatsoever. Former Yugoslavia was torn apart by Serb aggression. Serbia attacked Croatia. The Croats and the Serbs turned on the Bosnian Muslims. The nation was at war with itself. Whole towns disappeared overnight, like the thriving Muslim village of Ahmici, as I drove through Armici, I noticed that it looked before, it must have looked like any normal village. There were plants in windows. There were curtains at, at those windows. There were cars parked outside drives. There were kennels. There were television dishes pointed at the sky. It must have been normal, except it wasn't. 
Instead, the houses were gutted, the windows were broken. There was not one sound. It was eerie. The mosque had lost its minaret. The minaret had been toppled by explosives. But it pointed at the sky at a crazy angle, rather like a rocket. So I had the impression of a community that was like the United Kingdom at one time, totally dislocated by an event that had recently happened there. And of course the horror of it hadn't even started. We've got to find out what it is that makes normal people behave in such a foul way. People ask me, is it possible that something li like that could happen here in Britain? And I say, much faster than you, th than you can think. A quarter of a million people died. Those who survived, albeit with the scars of war, struggle to rebuild their lives. Some who believed they were lucky sought refuge here in Britain. How have we responded? Elements of the press quickly turned them into a new out-group, just like the brown eyes in Jane Elliott's exercise. How ironic that they find themselves back on our step one on the road to tyranny. I believe that refugees are entitled to the same rights as everyone else. And in fact, I think it's even more important that they should be afforded the same rights and dignity as other people because so many of them have suffered persecution and torture in their own countries. And for them to come here and for the process of dehumanization to be going on, uh, I think is a terrible indictment of our society. It's been a terrifying journey. But the human behavior that allows us to commit such atrocities is the very same behavior that can lead to supreme personal sacrifice. And the power of the group can be used for good as well as bad. The recent events in Serbia could be interpreted as a step back from tyranny. What seems to have been a people's revolution has ousted the tyrannical regime of Milosevic. But it's still too early to know if the new democracy will last. I believe the people in the Balkans are just like us. Put the circumstances like there were in the Balkans at the time, I'm quite sure we would go down the same road. There is no country in the world where human rights abuses do not occur. There is no country in the world which can claim to have a completely clean record. And the best countries are those which open themselves up the most to scrutiny and allow people to express their dissent and their opposition to anything the government may be doing. For me, the bottom line message is that we could be led to do evil deeds and what that means is to become sensitive to the conditions under which ordinary people can do these evil deeds. What we have been demonstrating throughout this program and to take a position of resisting tyranny at the very first signs of its existence. <laughs>